introduce our guest. But before he does so, I want to inform you that we do not have an intermission tonight. And after Ivo Dalder's speech, uh, Maarten van Rossum will open the discussion for the audience. And then in, in the later stage, there will be a Q&A. And, &A, and um, there are microphones in the, some of the aisles, and you can use them. I think we'll close around 9.45, maybe a little later. And I will be coming back here to give you some more announcements. For now, kindly switch off your mobiles, and uh, if you don't, have not already done so. And Martin, may I ask you to take the floor? Dames en heren, we hebben wat betreft de taal een hele complexe regeling afgesproken. Uh, het werd, de spits werd afgebeten in het Engels. Ik doe een introductietje in het Nederlands. Daarna is er een lezing in het Engels. En vervolgens is er een vraaggesprek wat ook in het Engels zal plaatsvinden. Daarna mag u vragen stellen uit de zaal. Die mag u ook in het Nederlands stellen. Want uit empirisch onderzoek is mij gebleken dat de heer Daalder voortreffelijk Nederlands nog steeds spreekt. Hij is er bescheiden over, maar we moeten gewoon onderstrepen dat hij in allerlei opzichten nog... Ja, ...heel redelijk als Nederlander door het leven zou kunnen gaan. Of hij dat ook wil, daar zullen we het nu vandaag niet uh, over hebben. Um, dat is dus de taalkundige regeling voor vandaag. Uh, het, het zal u ongetwijfeld, anders was u waarschijnlijk ook niet geweest... ...wel duidelijk zijn geworden dat uh, Daalder het uh, gemaakt heeft in de Verenigde Staten. Dat is toch voor een Nederlander, lijkt mij, een prestatie van formaat... Hij werkt daar als senior fellow voor de Brookings Institution en heeft ook voor de National Security Council gewerkt. En ik begreep uit een kranteninterview dat hij om daar te werken bij die National Security Council zijn Nederlands paspoort heeft moeten opgeven en een Amerikaans paspoort heeft moeten aanvragen. En toen dacht ik bij mezelf, onder vergelijkbare omstandigheden zou ik dat ook wel hebben gedaan. Bovendien had ik dan ook kunnen stemmen in de Verenigde Staten. En het had tenminste in ieder geval één stem gescheeld. <lacht> nou ja, ja, alles ergens beginnen dat soort van processen. Je moet, uh, je moet ook bereid zijn om die ene stem 100% au sérieux te nemen. Uh, als introductie wil ik nog wat zeggen over dat boek. Uh, dat ligt daar dus in twee versies, Nederlands en Engels. Als u één boek wilt lezen over de ontsporing van de Amerikaanse buitenlandse politiek in de afgelopen drie jaar, of als u het neutraler wilt over de ontwikkeling van de Amerikaanse buitenlandse politiek in de afgelopen drie jaar, dan moet u vooral dat boek lezen. Dat is namelijk een vrij compact boek, het is maar 200 pagina's. In de praktijk leert dat het veel moeilijker is om compacte boeken te schrijven dan om dikke boeken te schrijven. Uh, en in die zin moet dit als een prestatie van formaat worden opgevat. Het is bovendien een boek wat uh, uiteindelijk vernietigende kritiek levert, althans zo heb ik het geïnterpreteerd, op het buitenlands beleid van de zittende regering. Ik zou zeggen, concluderend kun je zeggen dat 85% van dat beleid in feite een dramatische mislukking is geworden. Dat doe ik op grond van de lezing van dat boek. Ik zeg, mijn eigen oordeel staat daar volkomen buiten. Ja, bij mij zou het zeggen 110% is een dramatische mislukking geworden. Dat, dat is een kwestie van persoonlijke opvatting natuurlijk. Uh, maar dat boek is, afgezien van het feit dat het een, naar mijn idee, overtuigende afrekening is met de tekortkomingen van de Amerikaanse buitenlandse politiek sinds uh, in januari 2001 en in het bijzonder na 11 september uh, van dat jaar, is het tegelijkertijd ook een eigenlijk wel aardige geschiedenis van wat zich in die jaren heeft afgespeeld. En het bevat ook een aantal hele aardige schetsjes van de personen die in die geschiedenis van die buitenlandse politiek een rol hebben gespeeld. Er is één punt waar ik zelf moeite mee had. Ik zal daar wellicht straks nog op terugkomen als er vragen gesteld mogen worden. En dat betreft de kwestie van de president zelf. En wat zijn rol precies is en hoe hij moet worden gewaardeerd als leider van de Verenigde Staten. Het thema van het boek, of het thema, een van de subthema's van het boek is dat de president eigenlijk de ware revolutionair is. Dat hij niet een soort van minkukel is die gestuurd wordt door Cheney en Rumsfeld, maar dat hij in feite de zaak goed in handen heeft. Dat hij de leider is van het team, dat hij in allerlei opzichten degene is die het initiatief heeft genomen voor... Dat beleid wat ik eerder heb uh, beschreven als ontspoord. 
hè, dat hij dus wel degelijk direct verantwoordelijk is. En ik geloof dat allemaal wel wat zij daar schrijven, Lindsay en Daalder, dat wil ik wel aannemen. Zij schrijven tegelijkertijd ook dat hij uh, willfully ignorant is, dat hij een ignoramus is, dat hij in feite, we weten dat ook op de krant, Bush leest geen kranten, ik denk ook dat je een boek zelfs van geringe afstand niet zou herkennen als iets waarmee je iets nuttigs zou kunnen doen. Um, en daar zit naar mijn idee de crux, want eigenlijk zou het misschien wel minder erg zijn als aangetoond zou kunnen worden dat hij gestuurd wordt door Rumsfeld en Cheney en andere smart guys, want die worden beschreven als smart guys. Daar zit natuurlijk ook een wonderlijke paradox in, hoe is het mogelijk dat een club van smart guys geleid door iemand die wel degelijk leiding kan geven, er zo'n potje van gemaakt heeft in de afgelopen jaren. Daar zit een soort van paradoxale uh, discrepantie in. Maar is in feite de toestand niet veel erger wanneer deze president ook de daadwerkelijke leider van het team is? He, de forceful leader die het verschil maakt. Want dan zitten we met een forceful leader die het verschil maakt, die in feite op basis van gut feelings, u ziet dat ik heel subtiel geleidelijk naar het Engels overga, die in feite bezig is om op basis van gut feelings de wereld te regeren. Want dat is nu eenmaal wat Amerika gezien de immense macht die die natie heeft verworven kan doen. Want dit is een man die geen enkele training had in de buitenlandse politiek, die geen idee had waar landen lagen, die dus ook niet, en dat is denk ik toch een vrij wezenlijk punt, de kennis heeft en het intellectuele apparaat, om zelfstandig na te denken. Hoe forceful hij misschien ook wel als leader is, hij is niet in staat om tot een afgewogen eigen oordeel te komen. In een ander stuk van Daler wat ik las, werd Clinton uh, beschreven als iemand die always negotiated with himself. En dat werd gedeeltelijk als verwijt gepresenteerd. Maar is niet iemand die negotiates with himself, iemand die in staat is tot nuance, tot aarzeling, want zo wordt door Daner en Lindsay Bush ook beschreven als iemand die geen enkele vorm van twijfel kent. Zijn er gevaarlijker mensen in deze wereld dan mensen die geen enkele vorm van twijfel kennen? Al was het waar omdat zij de overtuiging zijn toegedaan dat onze lieve heer 100% achter hen staat. Daar wou ik het voorlopig toe beperken, dus als u vlot Engels leest, zou ik zeggen, neem de Engelse editie. Ik moet natuurlijk vanwege het spectrum zeggen, als u geen vlot Engels leest, neem de Nederlandse editie. Maar het is een boek waar u werkelijk het een en ander van kunt opsteken, nog afgezien van de vraag wat u van Bush Junior denkt. Ik wou nog één vraag aan u stellen. Ik wou u namelijk vragen, gesteld dat u in de gelegenheid zou zijn, aanstaande november, 2 november te stemmen in de Verenigde Staten. Dan wil ik nu graag weten wie op dat moment op George Bush Jr. zou stemmen. Graag vingers. Helemaal hier. Met u komen wij nog te spreken in de loop van de avond. Wie, oh, daar nog iemand. Nou, dat is helemaal niet erg. Ging als u, in, u mag geen van alle stemmen, behalve dan de heer Daalder, die een hele zware verantwoordelijkheid heeft in deze. Die vertegenwoordigt ons allen, het Nederlandse gezond verstand, vertegenwoordigt hij bij de komende verkiezingen. Dan begrijp ik dus dat u... Nee, dan moet ik nog een nog veel pijnlijker vraag stellen. Wie gaat op die groene maloot stemmen? He? Ook niemand. Dan blijkt dus dat in feite afgezien van twee personen die door omstandigheden nog onbekend lichtelijk gederangeerd zijn geraakt, dat iedereen op Kerry gaat stemmen. En toch is de kans groot dat we een tweede boost te mee krijgen. Ik dank u tot zover tot uw aandacht en ik wil de heer Daalder uitnodigen om zijn lezing te houden. Well, thank you for, for an introduction like that. I'm not sure I should actually speak anymore. I, I'll just take questions. Um, because I think Martin, in, in, uh, in a few words, did a wonderful job of, of uh, saying what I'm going to say in many more words to you. Ik wou, ik kan nog Nederlands spreken. Ik wou Monique Knapen erg danken voor de uitnodiging om hier te komen. Ik wou Henk de Borg van het Spectrum bedanken om om een gok te wagen aan, aan, aan dit boek en het te vertalen. En Maarten voor, uh, voor zijn introductie.
Um, maar nu ga ik verder in het Engels. Uh, en de reden is heel simpel. In 1994 uh, werd mij verteld dat de Nederlandse wetgeving zou worden veranderd. Zodat mensen die Amerikaan worden het Nederlanderschap zouden kunnen blijven behouden. Nou, dat is makkelijk. Ik ben getrouwd met een Amerikaanse. Ik woon in Amerika. Ik had een mogelijkheid om een, op de uh, National Security Council te werken. Dus ik heb het Amerikaanse burgerschap aangevraagd. En helaas schijnt het dat... Uh, niet alleen het congres in Amerika heel langzaam werkt, maar ook de Eerste en de Tweede Kamer uh, in, uh, in, in, in Amerika. Want het is pas in 2002 mogelijk geweest om uh, twee nationaliteiten te hebben. Dus vandaar dat tegenwoordig, tot grote schok van mijn moeder, uh, ik nu niet meer in Nederland mag stemmen. Maar gelukkig nog wel in Amerika. Uh, en aangezien ik Amerikaans burger ben... En Jetlag, iets is waar, uh, waar in de tweede dag als je hier bent, uh, mee bezig bent, is het makkelijker voor mij door te gaan in het Engels. En we gaan daarna nog even een test kijken of ik het allemaal goed begrepen heeft. Uh, maar u kunt ook de Nederlandse versie in het Nederlands lezen. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is George W. Bush and the revolution that he has launched in American foreign policy. And it is a revolution. Here's a man who has started two major wars in just three years. He turned America from one of the most respected countries in the world to one that is most feared. He left an America that championed, indeed embraced international law, behind for one that has abandoned international treaties, agreements, and indeed international institutions. In these ways, George W. Bush represents a radical departure from the past. The extent of the change will be one of the main issues confronting the United States and indeed the world, but particularly the United States, in the election that is upon us this year. And the outcome of that election will in no small measure determine whether this revolution will be rejected or embraced. I already know what this room will uh, decide on that revolution. Unfortunately, you don't have any chance to vote. And besides, this room is not representative of the people who are on the other side of the pond. So tonight, I want to talk about the revolution of, uh, that George Bush has launched. I want to talk about the nature of the revolution. I want to talk about who and what are responsible for the revolution. And I want to talk about its implications for American foreign policy and therefore for the world. Let me start with the revolution. What do... I, and I will sometimes say I, I will sometimes say we, because the thoughts uh, that I am presenting you are very much thoughts that I share with my co-author, James Lindsay, um, whose Dutch is not good enough to even have an introductory uh, uh, speech here, so that's why I'm here. Um, what do we mean by the revolution? It's a revolution not of ends, not of the goals that America is pursuing under George Bush, but of means about how to achieve those goals, about how the United States should interact with the world. The essence of George Bush's revolution is that an America unbound is a more secure America. In a dangerous world, we must shed the constraints imposed by friends, allies, multilateral institutions, and international law. Allies constrain the ability of the United States to fight effectively in the wars that we must fight. We cannot fight, or so the people in the Pentagon continuously tell us, wars by committee, as we did in Kosovo. Institutions like the United Nations and even the time-tested institution of NATO don't work rapidly enough. They don't work quickly enough and effectively enough to deal with the problems that we confront so we can rapidly and immediately respond to the actions we must take. International treaties constrain America and do nothing to constrain the bad people. Remember, the International Criminal Court is not going to be designed to get the truly evil people. It will be used against the United States. The Biological Weapons Convention will do nothing to prevent people from acquiring biological weapons, but it will interfere 
with the pharmaceutical industry. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty will do nothing to prevent a Libya or a Pakistan or an India or a North Korea or an Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, but it will prevent the United States from improving its nuclear deterrent. The ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, will do nothing to make anybody secure except to deprive the United States of the ability to defend itself. The Kyoto Accord will do nothing to deal with the fundamental problem of global warming, but it will oppose a great cost on the United States. Those are the arguments from George Bush and his administration. Treaties constrain good people. They do nothing about constraining bad people. So the best way to maximize America's security, so George Bush and his administration argue, is to minimize the constraints on Washington's freedom of action. We in America have the power to pursue our national interest without any regard to what others think. Others can contribute little to our cause, and when they do, fine. When they don't, it is their problem. That is the nature and the state of the world as George Bush sees it. In practice, George W. Bush has abandoned a 60-year-old consensus about how the United States should engage the world a consensus that has encompassed Democrats and Republicans, not just Harry S. Truman or John F. Kennedy or William Jefferson Clinton, but indeed Richard M. Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and of course George W. Bush's own father. Instead of relying on international institutions as his predecessors have done, Bush has divided the world into those who are with us and those who are against us. Instead of embracing alliances, he has trumpeted coalitions of the willing. Instead of engaging in diplomacy and negotiations with our enemies, he has pushed for regime change. Instead of addressing threats with the time-honored strategies of deterrence and containment, he has trumpeted and focused on a strategy of preemption. This is a foreign policy that is breathtaking in its scope and radical in the departure from the norm. It is indeed revolutionary. Now how new is this revolution? It's one of the questions I constantly get asked. Unilateralism in American foreign policy is nothing new. Neither is Washington's penchant for ignoring its allies and indeed international institutions when it is suited its interest. Nor is failing to sign up or even adhering to international treaties when doing so was not in America's interest. And the ideology that is propelling this revolution has deep roots in American history. Henry Cabot Lodge, in the early 20s, argued that we needed to reject the League of Nations, not because America needed to be isolationist, but because of what he called the policy of the free hand. We had to be able to act in the way that America saw fit. John Foster Dulles, writing the platform in the 1952 Republican Convention, called for a rollback of communism no matter what anybody thought in the United Nations or NATO. These same people had similar ideas to the ones that George Bush has pushed now. But there is a difference. There's a difference in the past from what is happening right now. Now we can act upon the ideology that has triumphed within this administration in ways that we could not in the past. Lodge and his followers succeeded in torpedoing the League of Nations, and thereafter America drifted away into isolationism. John Fuster Dulles, in the end, was deterred by a smarter president, Dwight Eisenhower, who believed that a policy of rollback was not what you pursued in the face of the possibility of mutual nuclear annihilation. But this latter fear ended with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, which eliminated the risk of forceful uh, engagement strategy that George Bush has, tri has, has, has pushed. And 9-11, the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, gave Bush a real incentive and the political latitude to use American power in ways that he saw best. So that's why the revolution, though it has intellectual roots deep in American history, is only now able to find 
its real uh, road ahead. Where does this revolution come from? Who is responsible for this revolution? One of the, I guess, surprising elements, and, and Martin uh, van Rossum talked about this, is that we argue in America Unbound that George W. Bush is the revolutionary, that he is the puppeteer rather than the puppet. And we base this conclusion on two fundamental arguments. First, Bush is a man of very, very strong convictions about how the United States should engage the world. And he has, despite all arguments to the contrary, a clear and very coherent worldview. Secondly, Bush has approached the presidency much like a corporation where he is the CEO and very much in charge. Let me take those two arguments in turn. Bush has a clearly defined worldview. And though he might not be able to articulate it in a way that an international relations PhD would recognize, he still has a clear sense of how the world operates, a gut feeling, as he, a gut sense, as he told uh, Bob Woodward. This, to George Bush, is an exceedingly dangerous world. Before 9-11, before September 11, it was madmen and missiles. After the attacks, it was tyrants and terrorists that made this a dangerous world. In this dangerous world, it is states, not the forces of globalization, his predecessor always talked about, but states that determine what happened in international politics. And it is power, especially military power, that matters most. And those with the most power, as he might put it, matter the mostest. Yeah. Friends, allies, and international institutions are at best irrelevant to the pursuit of America's objectives. At worst, they're constraints on the ability of the United States to achieve what it is setting out to do. And this, finally, most importantly, America is a uniquely just global power, and others know it is so. And this last point, an essential part of Bush's worldview, is crucial. Bush is genuinely puzzled, even today, when he is confronted with evidence that others might not view the United States, and certainly not Bush's America, in the way he does. Shortly after the attacks on September 11, he asked himself during a nationally televised pro press conference, I wonder, why do they hate us? Like most Americans, he said, I, I just can't believe it because I know how good we are. Last year, when George Bush traveled to Asia, he said he was going to, quote, make sure that the people who are suspicious of our country understand our motives are pure. During the campaign, he would put his hand on his heart and says, I have a good heart. And that would be enough to convince anybody. After the meeting with a group of moderate Muslim leaders during his three-hour visit to Bali, he appeared flabbergasted that their view of America was not the same as his. Do they really believe we think all Muslims are terrorists, he asked in astonishment one of his aides. And he seemed equally distressed to learn that these leaders believed that America was so pro-Israel that it was, in fact, uninterested in creating a Palestinian state. But I gave a speech. That proves that I am in favor of a Palestinian state. Bush, of course, has no doubt about America's, and indeed his own, heart being pure. We're a good people, he likes to say. And he believes that others know it is so, and when they don't, it must be because they want America ill, not because America might be doing something they don't like. Where does this worldview come from, this sense of how the world works? How can a person who knows so little, who admits that he doesn't read the newspaper, come up with a coherent worldview? Well, it's the intellectual's conceit we here in Europe are as guilty 
of it as we are here in the, as of we are in the United States, to believe that somehow beliefs must be based on knowledge. In fact, it's a well known that new facts almost never change people's beliefs. They will be rationalized to fit with the prior convictions that people hold. During a campaign, George Bush and shortly after the war against NATO's war against Serbia, said something interesting. He said, I may not know where Kosovo is, but I know what I believe. Most of America focused on the first part of that sentence. How could he not believe, know where Kosovo was? And they ignored the second part, the fact that he knows what he believes. Bush has very strong convictions, and everyone knows that the more you know, the less strongly your convictions are likely to be held. That the more likely you have strong convictions, the less you know. If you ever had the misfortune of listening to right-wing talk radio in the United States, you will know what I'm talking about. Now, how do we know that it is George Bush's beliefs, not those of his advisors, but Bush's, that dominate American foreign policy? Well, that's the second argument. Bush has fashioned a CEO presidency in which he is indeed very much in charge. Bush sought out the best and the brightest. I must admit an unfortunate phrase in these times, given that that's what David Halberstam called Kennedy and Johnson's advisors during Vietnam. But anyway, he sought out the best and the brightest to lead the divisions of his corporation, the United States. He chose Cheney the vice president, not because of his electoral advantage, though I hasten to add those three votes in Wyoming did count, uh, depending on how you count votes, which is a, which is a trick in the United States. Um, but he chose Dick Cheney because, as he said, he would help me understand how to govern. He chose Don Rumsfeld and Colin Powell as the very smart people to lead his most important national security departments. Don Rumsfeld, who had been White House Chief of Staff, NATO Ambassador, and Secretary of Defense. Colin Powell, who has been in more positions as a principal than any other person in the United States. He had been National Security Advisor and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. None of these people were as Bush put it, shrinking violets, and in many ways neither was Condoleezza Rice. There's a tendency to believe that because he surrounded himself with advisors who were both smart and strong, and because Bush's knowledge of world affairs was to say the least limited, that his advisors must be in control. This indeed is the conventional wisdom in the town that I live in Washington, and maybe it is because there are a lot more advisors or wannabe advisors in Washington than there are people who are president or will be president. But the reality is with this president that George Bush is in charge. Bush, when he chose these people, acknowledged from the beginning, and will do so every day you ask him, that he will have to rely on his advisors to give him their best advice and to help implement the decisions that he indeed makes. But that is what a good CEO does. They are not experts of the divisions that are led by the best and the smartest. He would make the decisions. Here's a quote, December 2000. I'll be getting some of the best counsel possible, Bush said. There's going to be disagreement. I hope there is disagreement because I know the disagreement will be based upon solid thought. And what you, the American people, need to know is that if there is disagreement, I will be prepared to make the decisions necessary for the good of the country. And from the first day that George Bush entered the Oval Office, he made absolutely no secret about who was in charge. And he reaffirmed the fact that he was in charge repeatedly over and over again in public. You might not remember these examples, but they were crucial to determining and sending the message of who was in charge. Don Rumsfeld went up to Capitol Hill in February 2001 
and said, you know what, that defense budget that Bill Clinton introduced, we're going to get rid of it. We're going to plus it up by $50 billion because we need to take on um, an expansion of our defense capabilities. George Bush that afternoon issued a statement from the White House saying, no, we're not. We're going to stick exactly with the Clinton figure, and I just want people to remember who was president. A month later, Colin Powell stood in front of the U.S. and the State Department press corps and announced that when it came to the question of dealing with North Korea, the Bush administration would take off, take off where the Clinton administration had left off and continue negotiations. The next day, when George Bush went, met with the South Korean president and told him that he did not trust Kim Jong-il and was not going to negotiate with him, he turned to Colin Powell in the Oval Office and said, Colin, I think it is time for you to explain my position to the American people. And he sent him out of the Oval Office to stand on the White House driveway and announce to the world that whatever I said yesterday, I want you to know that we are not going to negotiate with the North Koreans. As he later would admit, he was a little far forward on his skis. He was off the slope when it came to that. Less publicly, but not necessarily unimportantly. Dick Cheney tried to take control of the most important process, the interagency process, the process by, why, by which the State Department and the CIA and the Defense Department get together to make decisions. He suggested to George Bush that perhaps he, the Vice President, should chair the meeting of what is called the Principles, a meeting that has traditionally been chaired by the National Security Advisor. And George Bush thought about it, and then he said, no, I think I would like Condoleezza Rice to do that. Then on September 12th, uh, Bob Woodward tells us Dick Cheney again went to the president and said, Mr. President, we need a war cabinet. And the president thought about it and he said, you know, you're right, Dick, and I'll chair it. And, these, and in other instances, George Bush has demonstrated that he's no shrinking violet either. He has been a decisive leader. He has been a bold leader. And he is a man who gets things done. Martin von Rossum uh, mentioned earlier that George Bush, unlike his predecessor, is a man who does ne not negotiate with himself. Compare going to war in Iraq with going to war in Kosovo. In Kosovo, the President of the United States went on national television to announce to the nation and the world that we were starting a bombing campaign, but don't worry, we were not going to use ground troops because of the fear that that might lead to a political backlash at home. George Bush did not constrain his military when it came to fighting the war. When George Bush wanted to cut American taxes, whether wisely or not is a different issue, but when he wanted to cut American taxes, he introduced a bill asking for $1.65 trillion of taxes in 10 years. Paul O'Neill went to him we now know, and said his Treasury Secretary, Mr. President, that's never going to fly. And he said, Paul, I do not negotiate with myself. It didn't fly. He only got $1.3 trillion, and the Democrats claimed victory. Those kinds of victories they can have. When George Bush announced in September of 2003 that Iraq was a little bit more difficult than he had thought, and therefore we needed 80 seven billion dollars. His approval rating in one week fell faster than in any president in the history of polling. He fell 10 points in one week after one speech. Six weeks later, he signed a bill for 87 billion dollars. We may not like these policies, but they are evidence of a leader who is able to get things done. This is not an administration that is following this leader blithely and without uh, argument. This is indeed an administration that Washington likes to talk about that is deeply divided among itself. But the most important division in this administration to really understand the nature of the revolution is not the division that Washington likes to talk about, that between the hardliners, Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld on the other side, 
and Colin Powell, which Richard Pearl now calls the soft liners, kind of a neat, neat phrase. The most important division in this administration is among the heartliners themselves. There are three schools of thought in this administration. You have what I call the pragmatic internationalists. It has a representative of one, Colin Powell. It is the kind of way of thinking in which Bush 41, Bush Sr., the 41st president, known as Bush 41 in the White House, liked to talk about. You then have what we in Europe love to talk about, the neoconservatives. We call them the democratic imperialists. They're slightly different than neoconservatives. Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, is its main protagonist. But there's a third group. They're called assertive nationalists. They're traditional conservatives. Don Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice. They're no neoconservatives. They're just plain old heartline conservatives. And the difference between these two groups of people is absolutely crucial. It is on how America is to be made secure. The neoconservatives, the democratic imperialists, argue that the United States can only truly be secure if the rest of the world is remade in America's image. If everyone is democratic, if prosperity is freely available to all, if individual rights are respected everywhere. The assertive nationalists, on the other hand, believe that America's security depends above all on defeating the threats to the United States. And these differences have played out dramatically and drastically and unfortunately in Iraq. The democratic imperialists wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein so they could turn Iraq into a beacon of democracy that ultimately would transform the entire Middle East. The assertive nationalists wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein because he was a threat. And once he was gotten rid of, democracy would be nice, but certainly not what we were gonna send our men and women to die for. Where's George Bush? in this debate? Well, so far he has adopted the rhetoric of the democratic imperialists, but he's adopted the policies of the assertive nationalists. Yes, George Bush has spoken stirringly about the need to transform the Middle East, and by God, you're gonna hear a lot more of it in the next months ahead. The failure of Iraqi democracy, he has proclaimed, would embolden terrorists around the world increase dangers to the American people and extinguish the hopes of millions in the region. Fine words, but his actions belie every single one of them. He has done next to nothing to encourage democracy in, say, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. He's called on the Palestinians to distance themselves from the leaders that he called, quote, were compromised by terror. But has he offered any material assistance to the Palestinians to get rid of these leaders, to build a better Palestinian national authority? Or has he indeed pushed Israel to make that possible? He remains deeply, deeply skeptical about an American role in what is called nation building, or better called state building. And his lackluster interest in this enterprise in Afghanistan demonstrates that. And look what happened just in the last 10 days in Haiti. We send 2,000 American soldiers into Haiti with absolutely no plan for how to remake or even make this country. And then there's Iraq, which have all the markings of repeating Afghanistan experience rather than the Japan experience of 1945. George Bush went to war to oust a dictator with no plan, none whatsoever, of how to rebuild Iraq. Because George Bush shared the assumptions of the assertive nationalists that it either didn't matter, or in any case, we would be greeted uh, as liberators and Iraq would miraculously take care of itself. Rather than increasing American forces to take care of the security problems, the insurgency and the terrorist threat that we now see, and it is blowing up day after day, Iraqi after Iraqi, Bush is cutting the U.S. force. I will put a wager on that by the end of the year, 
we will have 65,000 Americans rather than the 130,000 that were there just a few months ago. We see a concerted push now from the White House to speed up the Iraqification of the security forces inside the country, putting boys with guns and just two weeks of training in charge. A hell of a way to provide for security. So that Americans can pull out of the cities, as we're doing right now, sit in the desert, invulnerable to attack, and concentrate on the counterinsurgency mission. Yes, the number of Americans being killed today in Iraq is significantly lower than it was the month or two or three or four months ago. And so is the number of, America, of Iraqis that are being killed because nobody is providing for their security. The model that we're imposing here is not Japan or Germany 1945, as Paul Bremer would have it. It is Afghanistan, where there is a small part of that country that is safe and secure, Kabul, where the president of Afghanistan and turns out to be a mayor of a city rather than the leader of a country. If this man is serious, as he says he is, if he is seriously committed to the democratic imperialist cause, to remaking the world in America's image, he has indeed a very strange way of showing it. And that's when we hit the brick wall. The Bush revolution in foreign policy has hit in Iraq a brick wall. Contrary to expectations, going to war alone did not lead others to follow in America's wake. It did not elicit the kind of support that George Bush promised the American people we would get. 85% of all the troops in Iraq today are American. 90% of all the foreign casualties in Iraq today are American. 95.6% of the dollars spent on reconstruction in Iraq in 2004 are American. Secondly, the revolution is failing in its central doctrine of preemption. Remember, we were going to overthrow regimes because they were, before they posed threats to us. It turns out that this preemption doctrine was a universal doctrine applicable in exactly one single case. And I hasten to add, you didn't need to have this doctrine to go to war against Saddam Hussein. You had plenty of UN Security Council resolutions to allow you to do that. And if you want to be convinced that the revolution has run its course in Iraq, there is a little memorandum that Donald Rumsfeld uh, wrote and was leaked to the USA Today last October in which he famously warned of a long, hard slog in Afghanistan and Iraq. But more importantly, he admitted that two years into the war on terrorism, we still had no, no, no way of knowing whether we were winning or losing. We didn't even know how we would measure it. Imagine one of your directors of your divisions of corporations telling you that they had no idea whether the thing they had been doing for two years was working. Do we need a more stunning indictment of this administration's policy than Rumsfeld's own memo? When you're headed for a brick wall, you can do three things. You can continue to head on into the wall, which for George Bush means he will not be reelected. You can go left when you get to the wall to a pre-revolutionary foreign policy and embrace the cooperative engagement and Colin Powell has been telling you to do and that every president since World War II prior to Bush has embraced. Or when you get to a brick wall, you can go right. You can narrow the focus of your foreign policy. You can narrow Americans' involvement in the world to the things that are truly important in order in part to respond to an American public increasingly disillusioned of the costs of your revolutionary engagement. Bush is far too smart to run into a brick wall. If there is one thing he is committed to, it is to being reelected, thus bettering his father's record. So the real question for George Bush is will he go left or will he go right? Everything I know about George Bush and everything I've been telling you about him today 
suggests that he will not do the smart thing and he will move rightward. He will narrow America's involvement in the world. He will focus less on the things that matter to others and more on the things that are truly important to him. And the result will be a disaster for America. It will be a disaster for the world. But unfortunately, it is fully consistent with the course he has set on. And with that positive, upbeat note, I look forward to your questions. Horloge, maar dat heb ik weggemaakt. Dus. Ja, misschien is dat wel handig. Misschien heb ik het hier ergens. Een Amerikaans, een Amerikaans horloge, dat loopt beter. Ja, dat is een ja. Kijk aan, wacht even. Ja, I, uh, I would like uh, to start with the question that I already suggested in my introductory notes. Oké, okay, he is a forceful leader. Oké, okay, he is not dumb. Uh, But then, what? Uh, isn't he a very dangerous person just because of the fact that he is a very forceful leader and he may be kind of streetwise and smart, but he doesn't know a thing about the world. He knows a lot of things, but not about the world. And isn't he therefore not a very dangerous person because all these great decisions that he has taken have already turned out to some extent completely wrong and disastrous for the United States. Yes, he's a very dangerous person. But the argument that you see in Washington and the argument that you see in this country that he is a dumb ignoramus who is not in charge of his administration and his foreign policy absolves him of the responsibility for those policies. I once spent some months advising a former presidential candidate who is no longer a presidential candidate. He screamed too loudly, apparently. <laughs> And I told Governor Dean to read the book. And he came back and said, I don't like this book. You make out George Bush to be much smarter and interesting than I think he is. I said, to a pre-revolutionary foreign policy and embrace the cooperative engagement that Colin Powell has been telling you to do and that every president since World War II prior to Bush has embraced. Or when you get to a brick wall, you can go right. You can narrow the focus of your foreign policy You can narrow Americans' involvement in the world to the things that are truly important in order, in part, to respond to an American public increasingly disillusioned of the costs of your revolutionary engagement. Bush is far too smart to run into a brick wall. If there is one thing he is committed to, it is to being reelected, thus bettering his father's record. So the real question for George Bush is will he go left or will he go right? Everything I know about George Bush, and everything I've been telling you about him today, suggests that he will not do the smart thing and he will move rightward. He will narrow Americans' involvement in the world. He will focus less on the things that matter to others and more on the things that are truly important to him. And the result will be a disaster for America It would be a disaster for the world, but unfortunately it is fully consistent with the course he has set on. And with that, positive, upbeat note, I look forward to your questions.
had een horloge, maar dat heb ik weggemaakt. Dus. Ja, misschien is dat wel handig. Misschien heb ik het hier ergens. Een Amerikaans, een Amerikaans horloge, dat loopt beter. Ja, van Genève. Ja. Kijk aan, wacht even. Ja, uh, I would like uh, to start with the question that I already suggested in my introductory note. Okay, he's a forceful leader. Okay, he is not dumb. Uh, but then, what? Uh, isn't he a very dangerous person just because of the fact that he is a very forceful leader and he may be kind of streetwise and smart, but he doesn't know a thing about the world. He knows a lot of things, but not about the world. And isn't he, therefore, not a very dangerous person? Because all these great decisions that he has taken have already turned out, to some extent, completely wrong and disastrous for the United States. Yes, he's a very dangerous person. But the argument that you see in Washington and the argument that you see in this country, that he is a dumb ignoramus, who is not in charge of his administration and his foreign policy, absolves him of the responsibility for those policies. I once spent some months advising a former presidential candidate who is no longer a presidential candidate. He screamed too loudly, apparently. <laughs> and I told Governor Dean to read the book, and he came back and said, I don't like this book. You make out George Bush to be much smarter and interesting than I think he is. I said, Governor, if you want to defeat George Bush, you have to defeat George Bush. You can't run against Dick Cheney or Don Rumsfeld or whoever. George Bush is responsible. You need to convince the American people, not just that he's dumb, they already think that. You got to convince him he's dangerous. You have to convince him he's an extremist, that he's radical, revolutionary, that he, he has taken the United States in the wrong direction. The politically smart thing to do is to recognize that George Bush is in control. So the fact that he is in control should not undermine the argument that that is dangerous. It is the other part of the argument that he is somehow not in control that absolves him of any responsibility. That's, the American people already believe that. And this election, if it's going to be won by the Democrats, is going to be won because somehow the American people become convinced that there is one extremist in this race and one conservative. And the conservative is going to be the Democrat, who's going to conserve fiscal sanity who's going to conserve civil rights, who's going to conserve America's commitment to international institutions and international law, who's going to conserve the long-standing relationships with allies that this president in each and every instance has radically undermined. That's why it is important to know whether he's in charge or not. I suppose you're going to vote for John Kerry. Um. But uh, that leads uh, more or less automatically into the next question, uh, which is then, of course, about the elections. Has John Kerry any chance of beating George Bush? Because if Bush is so smart, and if, if he's smart about anything, he's smart about American politics, not about the world. He's smart about American politics. And is John Kerry able, will he be able to beat him? Challengers do not beat incumbents. Rule number one in politics, and certainly in American politics. Incumbents may beat themselves, but incumbents lose, challengers never win. Remember, three times, four times since Second World War, have incumbents lost. Lyndon, Ro uh, Lyndon Johnson didn't even decide to run because he was losing. He probably would have won if he had, no, he probably would if not he had have. taken but, but part it, in the race. Jerry Fort lost. Jimmy Carter lost. George Bush lost. What was the common characteristic? The most important thing is was a challenge, it was an incumbent that was being challenged internally within his own party. 
Eugene McCarthy in 68, uh, Ronald Reagan in 1976, Teddy Kennedy in 1980, and Pat Buchanan and later Ross Perot in 1992. George Bush has the most united Republican Party behind him that anybody has ever had, with the exception probably of Ronald Reagan in 84. So far, that may still change, but so far. Um, by the way, George Bush on Tuesday, yesterday, won formally enough delegates to be, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the Republican nominee. Secondly, incumbents with United Parties running in an election year in which the economy is doing well get reelected. And whatever one thinks about the particular statistics on the economy, it's doing well enough, even if job creation is a problem. So you're left with one ingredient determining the fundamental chances of re-election, peace. And that's why this election is going to turn on Iraq or, God forbid, another terrorist attack, which nobody can have a handle on, so it's an unknown. If things go badly in Iraq, the Democrats will be elevated to office. George Bush will lose. But you just have sketched in your lecture that they will not go bad in Iraq because you, it's quite easy to design a strategy where American soldiers don't die in Iraq, at least for a few months. At least through November 2nd, and that's why, if I'm a betting man, all of you are wrong except those two people who were right, which is that I think George Bush is going to be reelected. They were going to vote for him. A lot of people here are pessimistic and realistic people, and they will realize okay. that they you're will all have right, to live. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to vote for him. I couldn't vote for him, but uh, I'm quite pessimistic about John Kerry's chances for the presidency. Um, Another question, that, that one about Iraq, because that's a thing that I've never understood up until today, and that is what were the real reasons for attacking and occupying Iraq? Because all the given reasons were evidently false or irrelevant or just idiocy or whatever. Um, you said in your lecture that even these assertive nationalists did this attacking Iraq because they thought it was a threat. I would say that any intelligent newspaper reader knew at that particular moment that Iraq was not a, a immediate threat to the United States. For example, before September 11, Iraq was a secondary question. And Powell had declared that he is in a box and he is contained, there's no great reason to do something about Iraq. So why was Iraq suddenly a threat? Why did they undertake such an expensive thing without there being any real threat to the United States or the region or the world or whatever? What was the real reason for doing it? Just stupidity? I cannot believe that. We have, what, 45 more minutes? Okay. Well, okay. Well, if, no. if you can it, give an answer, that would be no, I, 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 I think I know the answer. I think I know an answer. Fundamental is what happened on, at 8.46 a.m. on September 9, 2001. Prior to that, foreign policy was not important to this president or the presidency. After that, foreign policy became the only thing that mattered. Prior to that, Iraq was a pestering problem. After that, it became a risk too great to live with if you could do something about it. And then there is George Bush and his team about how they looked at the world. Most people, myself included, looked at what happened on September 11 as the dark side of globalization. Here you had a transnational group, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, that had exploited the forces of globalization to devastating effect. A bunch of guys training in Afghanistan, hatching a plot in Hamburg, training to fly planes, not to take off or land, but just to be able to go left or right in Phoenix, Arizona, hijacking aircraft in Washington, New York, and Boston, and plowing in, into the World Trade Center. That for $500,000. That's all it took. 
19 kids, $500,000 in the transnational network of terror. This was what happened on September 11. But here are a bunch of people who don't believe in globalization. They think it's a dirty word. They never use it. They don't think this is how the world works. The world works with states. And from their perspective, the only way a threat like this could ever happen is if states sponsored it. Bob Woodward's book on Bush at War, a remarkable book, unlike many of his other books, this one is truly remarkable, based on uh, contemporary notes from Stephen Hatley, one of the most obsessive note takers, the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, that exists. Um, man takes notes about everything, he's a lawyer. Uh, these are good notes. Records George Bush remarking three times in the months after September 11 that he knows Saddam was behind this. Absolutely, we don't have the evidence, but he knows it. And in, and in their perspective, this could not have happened without tyrants being part of it. It is an essential way of how they look at the world. May, may we, I ask a very small sub-question? Because I've, I've read Woodward's book, and one of the strangest things about the book is that, yes, indeed, after about seven days, Bush says, uh, Saddam has something to do with this. And none of the principal ask him the most normal question that you can think of. How do you know? Where did well, you hear that? I mean, them, who did your phone? Because most of them had the same perspective. But isn't that weird? No. Yes, it I is mean, weird. They're wrong. But, it, you know, you need to explain it. If you don't believe in the ability of, if you believe that the international system is made out of states competing, uh, you know, we quote Doug Five, who says directly in the New Yorker uh, that Without states, terrorists just can't operate. I mean, utter nonsense when you think about it. In fact, you don't have to think about it. It's just utter nonsense. Uh, but it is a very firm belief. If you believe that states are behind it, I mean, how do you get from 9-11 to Iraq without that leap? How do you get from 9-11 to the State of the Union speech of January 2002? How do you get from 9-11 to the axis of evil? You don't get there that quickly unless you believe that states are fundamental. So here you have, you have a worldview, generally shared by most advisors, that states are critical. You have an evidence of what it means to be attacked, which was shocking. Shocking to the nation, shocking to the system, shocking to the president. Um, and finally, a belief that you could do something about it. In fact, Iraq was not a threat that made war possible. North Korea was a threat. That made war impossible. It was the very notion that it was not an immediate threat that made war possible. We were going to attack Iraq. It was going to be over. It was going to be a cakewalk. It was going to be easy. This is Paris, 1944. We we're going to drive the tanks through Baghdad. The people would stand there with flags. We would put roses in their muskets, and we would go straight home. Small problem. Paris was not, this was not Paris 1944. This is incompetence on, yes, on a totally. very, very high level. Very dangerous incompetence. It's a total dangerous incompetence, which is why they need to be defeated. But it doesn't mean that they don't believe. Yeah, but any, even people who have strong beliefs should ask for some proof for their strong beliefs. And here, evidently, never anybody asked for proof of what they so strongly believed. No, you don't, you don't. And then, of course, they lied to the world for two years about what they believed, I well, suppose. You, you don't need belief, you don't need the proof if you believe uh, that even if they had nothing to do with 9-11 with on the day it happened, they would have something to do with the 9-11 that was to come. And that's where the whole concept of preemption comes in. That even if there was no direct link between Saddam and Osama on September 11th, a bad man, you know, take two bad men, mix them together, and you have another terrorist attack. Uh, simplistic, yes. But we're talking about George Bush. Yeah, I am, I'm realizing that. He's probably not the smartest you sketched him to be. Uh, because a really smart guy 
doesn't do a thing like this without at least researching the situation, what's going to happen, what's the situation in Iraq, uh, is it going to cost a lot of money, yes or no, they, they never did these things. That is the st and it was not a threat, that is what's so strange about this whole situation. You're fighting terrorism, that's okay with the Americans, with the world, and then you do something so incredibly dumb and stupid, which will, which will cost 50 billion dollars a year for, for years and years on end probably. And what is won by occupying Iraq? Nothing actually. It probably stimulated terrorism. Yes, but if you believe that Iraq became the central front on terror, then it was worth it. Let me quote you Ed Gillespie, if you hope you never meet the man, the uh, chairman of the Republican National Con uh, of the National Committee. It is better to kill a terrorist in Kabul than in Kansas and Baghdad and Boston. Simplistic? Yes. Does it ring truth to the vast majority of the American people? Yeah. It works. And the challenge for the United States, for those who think this is the wrong way to go, is to have a better argument. And in fact, that argument is based on the belief that there is a finite number of terrorists, as opposed to the possibility that what you're doing in Iraq is creating more terrorists, uh, which is the argument I make, that any, every terrorist you kill in Kabul will create two more that want to kill Americans in, in Kansas. Uh, but that's a more sophisticated argument. It's a more difficult one to bring. And then if you have John Kerry, who can bring that in 15 minutes, but not in one second, you got a problem. And he, of course, voted for the war. He voted for the war. Yeah. Which was stupid, too. Um, yeah. I agree. I didn't vote for the war, but I wasn't allowed to. Yeah. I was completely against the war. Nobody phoned me. Strange, but that's the case. That's why they didn't yeah. phone you. Actually, 50% of the Dutch were for the war, which is a lot more than in most European countries. Most Dutch journalists were for the war because they are... Well, let's not continue this sentence. Um, any questions from the audience? Is there anybody? Yeah, right there? Yeah? Could you stand up and speak clearly? Yeah. Come, um, want to come to the microphone here? Yeah, it's difficult to climb. Uh, and scream loudly. Can anybody, can, can people hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, in Iraq or the decision to go to Afghanistan? Well, let me separate those two because I don't think that, I think whoever was president, if the person who was elected to be president in fact was president, that's Al Gore, um, Afghanistan would have been a given, no doubt. Uh, so the real issue is Iraq. And I, I get asked this question a lot and I think there were, it's very difficult to know whether Al Gore would have gone to war in Iraq. And here's the reason why. If you were to take two Democrats more committed to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, uh, or at least as committed to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein as Republicans, it were Al Gore and Joe Lieberman. Al Gore ran in 1991, 92 on a platform and with a series of speeches that George Bush had done the nation a great disservice for not going to Baghdad. Uh, Joe Lieberman, of course, had been Mr. Let's Get After Saddam Hussein from well in the 80s when he was uh, arguing that the first Bush, the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration were appeasing Saddam, which they did until August 1st, 2nd. So under those circumstances, and given the American political climate in which you would have seen the very people who were now in government calling loudly for going after Iraq. Uh, it is very possible that Iraq would have been uh, you know, stage two or phase two as it was then also called in the war on terror. The reason I hesitate is not only because Al Gore in October 2002 gave probably the best single speech against the war that was made in the United States. Um, probably. Teddy Kennedy gave a pretty darn good one too and so did uh, Senator Byrd. Um, 
but because I think they would have looked at the post-9-11 world in a different way than George Bush did. You know, it is important to know that it's Bush who is in control and not his advisors. So I do not mean in terms of, you know, comparing the Bush administration to an alternative administration by Gore, but uh, if indeed the Bush administration would have been dominated by, let's say, Cheney, uh, uh, Rumsfeld, uh, uh, etc., as opposed to your argument that it matters that uh, Bush is in control. Well, no, if the neoconservatives had been in control, then they would have gone to Iraq before 9-11. I mean, that's an easy one. Uh, no, there, there is nobody in this administration with the exception of Colin Powell who was against the war. Nobody. Uh, and Colin Powell would have been against the war if the Republicans or the Democrats or whatever. So no, I, I cannot use Iraq as a proof for my thesis. Um, yeah. can, I, can I ask the question here? I have the microphone, so yeah. I'll take the question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I actually want to continue this question about leadership. Um, I think that Martin van Rossum quite, quite rightly has um, challenged you on that. I think it's your greatest contribution of this book that you do make uh, Bush responsible and accountable. I think that that's uh, rightly so. But I think that uh, in doing so... Um, I, I think you gloss over, or let's say, there might be alternative readings of how the power within the Bush administration works. Um, it seems, you know, you're starting out, I understand that when the book was written, most people said, yes, Bush is dumb, and um, coming from that very low expectation to say that, yes, he was in charge, he said no at some points, seems to me for a leader, well, what, whatever should one expect uh, to be a leader of the world. So I think that that does still doesn't answer really the intriguing question of how decision making is, um, uh, you know, occurs within the uh, Bush administration. You use words like um, leader in charge, bold, getting things done, being in control, but might also not be other readings like he, he has a sense of entitlement, um, he's demeaning to other people, grown-up men who have more experience, um, he has kind of misguided manliness, um, he leads by fear, and yes, he's ign ignorant. It's not, not possible to uh, have a different reading and to also see that Rumsfeld and others, and I, I think I agree with the previous uh, person, uh, that people like Cheney and others play him also. So I understand your argument, he's not only a puppet, he's a puppeteer, but I think power and leadership works differently. Could you elaborate on that also given the book that has been published since your book, the O'Neill book on the price of loyalty? Yeah, I mean, I, uh I know it's hard to believe that somebody you deeply disagree with and in fact do not respect can actually be a leader. But you know, I don't want to make the comparison, but Adolf Hitler was a leader too. Doesn't make it right, yes, wrong, or whatever. Yeah, strong beliefs. Yeah, well, that's for sure. Uh, put it in another way. George Bush chose certain people to be his advisors. He didn't choose people who were his daddy's advisors, with the exception of Colin Powell, who frankly was chosen not for his beliefs or his positions, but for his standing in the Republican Party. And Colin Powell's greatest contribution to George Bush was made up to and the point that the voters went to the booth, and after which his contribution was negligible, neg negligible except that having promised that he would be Secretary of State, he had to make him Secretary of State. But then he ignored him ever since. If you look at the true Vulcans, the new book about the Vulcans, but the Vulcans, the, people who, the, the eight people who were his advisors during the campaign, not on that list were people like Brent Scowcroft, Jim Baker, Richard Haas, that is the traditional, moderate, pragmatic wing of the Republican Party. They were all conservative, 
hardliners, some neoconservative, some just plain old conservative, but they were all hardliners. He didn't have to choose Dick Cheney as his vice president. He didn't have to choose, choose Don Rumsfeld as the Secretary of Defense, but he did. Now, it is possible that just by luck, by going in and in the team pond grutte, he came up with that bunch of people. But somehow I have a feeling that he came up with that kind of bunch of people because they reflected what he believed. He was comfortable with them. And he wanted people who were, who saw the world in the same way that he did. And therefore, it's not surprising that Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld have a lot of influence in Washington and in the Bush administration. It's not surprising that they win arguments over Colin Powell, not because they're better at playing bureaucratic politics, because the president agrees with them. Now, we can look at the direction of causality. Is it Dick Cheney, who is the, puppet, who is the puppeteer, and George Bush the puppet? Um, I'll quote Dick Cheney. You don't become a two-term governor of Texas beating one hell of a good politician in Ann Richards in, 1980, in 1994 and the president of the United States. However that election may have, uh, however, whatever one might think about the particular nature of that election, without having some idea about how to run certain things, like a government. And I think George Bush knows a lot about how to run a government. I go further. I think Democrats can learn a lot from how George Bush runs. Not about what he does, but how he does it. Uh, uh, I know you, you earlier said that I criticized Bill Clinton. I used to work for Bill Clinton. It was Manning working for the man. He could never make up his mind about anything. And as a result, you had this back and forth constant about what it is to do. I worked on the most horrific policies in the 1990s, Bosnia, where for two years he couldn't make up his mind. I'll take George Bush, a leadership characteristic, because you know in 1993 something different would have happened, I would have hoped, with the Democrat, with the kind of belief that, that Bill Clinton have had and the kind of leadership that, that George Bush has demonstrated. That doesn't mean that we have to say that George Bush is a fantastic, wonderful leader. It doesn't mean uh, that he's right. No, he's not. He's wrong. He's fundamentally wrong. Uh, disastrously so. Um, but it is, if it makes you more comfortable to say, you know, I don't want to believe that he has good characteristics, that's okay. I just think that misses the point of this presidency. It misses the point in November the 2nd when I think he's going to be reelected, in part because of the skills he has demonstrated. Now, there's, there's another one who was before you, but you, you will be next, okay? Yeah. Thank you. And while I agree with all of your observations, which are very good, I also have to remind you about Godwin's law, uh, which originally applied on discussions on the Internet, saying that any discussion will ultimately deteriorate to a point where somebody mentions Hitler, and that person will automatically lose the debate. Uh, I was I very intrigued by your observation that what really allowed the current regime to do what they're doing was actually the end of the Cold War. I originally come from Finland with a sort of some experience of living with a sort of fairly dangerous neighbor that keeps you in check. Um, I would actually like to hear your view on whether, because I really unfortunately believe that you can't fight belief and religion with logic, that yes, Unfortunately, Bush will probably be re-elected. Is there any external way that he could be kept in check? I don't believe Northern Korea will be that check. Do you think Beijing is what's going to save the world? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think the answer to that is yes, in two ways. One is I think there's, there, the lesson of the last three years is when Europe is united and says no, things don't happen. Uh, if you didn't want Iraq to happen, you have a large part of the responsibility. You were here in Europe, in Britain, in this country. Um, I'll take the example of steel tariffs. Europe said no, stood together, went to the WTO, got the sanctions, and two, and two days later, Bush caved. 
You're sure he made a wonderful speech on, on, on what it had to do with, you know, it was okay now to do it and he did, uh, because, uh, and there were good economic reasons for him to cave, but it was, but it wouldn't have happened without European pressure. How far does that get you? Not terribly far, but it gets you some part of the way. Uh, the, the other way in which it works, it seems to me, is, I mean, I think most Europeans understand, in the way that George Bush doesn't, that in order to deal with the fundamental problems we face today, whether it's terrorism or weapons proliferation or climate change or infectious diseases or spreading democracy or whatever you, good and bad you want to do, uh, it requires international cooperation. That even a country as powerful as the United States is not able to do all these things together. And we're seeing it in Iraq. In Iraq, the fact that the United States is occupying the country itself is the problem. It's not that it can't do a lot of good things. It's just that doing it alone makes it impossible. Um, so, in order to address these problems, recognizing that cooperation is important, deciding to abstain. You don't have to oppose. You don't have to buy into the Chirac notion of multipolarity. You just have to abstain and say, uh, we're not going where you're going, which in many ways is what has happened with regard to Iraq, uh, where with the small exception of Poland and the UK, maybe the Netherlands, uh, everybody else has abstained, at least not done as much as they could. Um, uh, the result is, is a backlash. It takes a long time. But, so given that the problems require international cooperation, not wanting to be part of cooperation ultimately will have an impact. The, the danger is that with this president and these beliefs and, uh, and this world view, he is likely not to say and to see the, the shining light and say, oh my God, I need to cooperate. He's just going to do less. Um, and I'm a firm believer in American power. I believe that an American power is necessary. Uh, I think the great phrase that Madeleine Albright used of the indispensable power is absolutely right. I don't think we can solve any of the world's problems without the United States being part of it. Uh, and that's my biggest fear, is to see the United States retreat because of the cost of being so disastrously wrong. Um, and it may take another four years before that cost becomes so evident that even the American people will vote in the way to change it but at least we have elections every four years. Yeah, in the gallery. Uh -huh. I don't think that's, that's well, quite uh, that logically that okay. <laughs> Is that a kind of system that you have developed up there? <laughs> If you use the mic, keep it to your mouth. It doesn't work. No. What is the U.S. position? What is the U.S. Uh, US position exactly on, on uh, enlarging NATO, and uh, especially since it seems that Europe um, doesn't favor the enlargement that much? It's, uh, Britain, France uh, never uh, pushed very hard to to get the enlargement through. It seems uh, like countries, especially like the Baltic states, um, now are able to join because of U.S. pressure. What, what is the reason that uh, the U.S. is uh, so much in favor of enlarging NATO to, to 27 to 30 countries? Um, well, I was just wondering if you have a, um, a nice insight on that for me. I don't know about nice, but um, <laughs> I mean, the fundamental reason why the, Bush, the, the Clinton administration embarked on the enlargement of NATO is the belief that by offering the prospect of membership, to, West, to the, the Western Club, uh, defined both as the European Union and NATO, uh, the prospects for reform, both economic and political, in, in the countries of the former, the former Soviet bloc countries, uh, would be enhanced. And there was a practical argument that it would have been nice if the EU could have gone first. But the reality is that it's more difficult, as we all know, 
to enlarge the European Union and it is to enlarge a defense alliance like NATO. So NATO went first. Uh, and that's what it's all about. It is about enhancing the prospect for the democratic and economic transition of these countries. And then once that has happened, to capture it and to make it irreversible, uh, or at least as irreversible as possible. I mean, it's been an extraordinarily successful policy. I mean, Europe is more peaceful, more united, more democratic than it has been in every, any point in history. And I think the, 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 the use of NATO enlargement and the EU enlargement as means to that end has been extraordinarily successful. Uh, it also means that NATO no longer is what it once was, a defense alliance. But, you know, since it was a defense alliance against the country and a threat that no longer exists, this is about as good as you're going to get. And what is it now, uh, according to you? You say it's not anymore what it was, not just a defense alliance. How would you, uh, could you very it's a, shortly it's a talking It's a talking shop. Um, sort of a, uh, for with, a which, which, which allows different militaries to work together and to have some sense of interoperability so that if there is a case they want to work together, they're more likely to be able to talk to each other over the same radio. Uh, and that's very important. I mean, if you believe in international cooperation, having the structures of cooperation there is extraordinarily important, but it's not a defense alliance. An alliance against whom? Uh, thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Is it the problem now that the most important NATO member is actually not interested anymore, or not that more, not that much in in, in NATO? Well, if if what you said was right, then this is a this is a government, and this is a and well probably the same government in the next four years, which uh, works with coalitions of the willing, which is not particularly interested in allies at all, which thinks that it doesn't need them. What about NATO when? when its most important member becomes, in a way, a marginal member of the organization. It's a problem, but it's also a reality, which is, very, which is the notion that you can continue the NATO that we all grew up with and most of us came to love in a fundamentally different security environment is, uh, is not based on a realistic assessment. The United States and Europe are drifting apart not because of George Bush or because of the leadership of, of France or Germany or whatever, but because of the reality that compared to the period of the Cold War, the Americans need Europeans less and the Europeans need the Americans less. I mean, I've called this the end of transatlanticism, uh, where the notion which was popular during the Cold War that American foreign policy had to be mediated through the prism of Europe is just gone. And the same is true in Europe. The notion that you had to mediate your foreign policy with regard to what Washington thought is less, if not gone altogether, and that's the reality. Uh, so that the most you can hope uh, for an organization like this is, one, to use it as a means to, to get the gains of the end of the Cold War, and what a tremendous thing it is. And remember, we fought for 50 years over this issue. We won without firing a shot. Uh, we won in a very in a way that is the best thing that ever happened to these people. Uh, to be free, to be part of the European experience, to make Europe a zone of peace, it's remarkable com compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I'm more than happy that NATO was part of that, that process, and if NATO is not going to be, it's going to be a different organization to, to make that, uh, that better, that's, that's all for the good. Uh, and, and it's a nostalgia to believe that NATO should become, the, can continue to be the focal point of American foreign policy. It's not going to be, uh, uh, nor should it be. And the notion that you find among Atlantic, the, the Atlanticists in Washington, the three that are left, um, that we should na use NATO now to, to, uh, to take on the great experience of the greater Middle East is poppycock. What could I NATO hope, do? I hope so, yeah. Uh, yeah, question here. I would like to ask a more personal question, Ivo. You talked about your American passport, but it sounded more like mechanics. I would like to know, what are you? Are you American? Are you Dutch? Are you both? And related to that, and I'm like you, married to an American and sort of feeling a little bit of both, how does that impact your effectiveness in this debate? Because people might read the 
harsh criticisms of the Bush administration as coming from a European, coming from somebody who's not one of us, and therefore he must be against us. So do you feel that that half and half situation impacts your position as a scholar in these subjects? Uh, short answer is no. And it's very simple. I mean, the United States is an extraordinarily tolerant and open society when it comes to immigrants. And you're one of them as long as you have a passport. Uh, and even in many ways when you don't have a passport. Uh, the Bush administration may not like me, but it's because I'm a Democrat, not because I'm Dutch. Uh, uh, how do I feel, you know, I think the one way you always know how you feel, imagine the World Cup, Holland against USA. Guess who I'm going to be supporting? Going to win. Uh, so that tells you everything. I'm the only one in the United States who I think looks at Wereldkampioenschap schaatsen, right? <laughs> and it's not because Bonnie, Bl whatever her name is, uh, Bonnie Blair or whatever is, is playing. So, you know, that's that what is. And yes, it was mechanical in the sense that I very deliberately became an American citizen in the full expectation I'd be a dual national. Uh, and, but that didn't work out because politics being what politics is. Do I regret it? No, not really. You know, I, I'm, I left here 28 years ago, uh, and um, I have family here, and it's wonderful to come back, and I like Drop, and the, I eat more Gouda Kaas than anybody else. And, and in fact, I'm the sole customer of, of the Gouda Kaas boer in uh, wherever it is that I buy my cheese in, in Washington. But I'm, I'm, I feel American. I am American. My kids, they only know Opa and Oma, and that's about it when it comes to, uh, to Dutch. So. And I don't regret that they don't know the language. Okay. Yeah, you there. I wonder, in the context of what you have told us, what's your opinion on Tony Blair's decision to uh, stick with the United States and therefore come into conflict with Europe is? I think Tony Blair truly believed in what he did. I think that was it. He's a conviction politician. Strange for a man who was known as, as Mr. Finger in the Wind, um, Mr. Focus Group. Um, I, I think um, for a whole variety of reasons. You know, when he became prime minister in 1997, he was for the first time in his entire life exposed to intelligence information. It was the first time he was in government. Uh, and as a backbencher, you don't or not, as, as a shadow uh, person, you don't get that kind of information, unlike in the United States, where presidential nominees get uh, president, the presidential daily brief, the most secret um, intelligence information during the campaign. Uh, he had none of that when he became prime minister, and by all accounts was completely shocked about what he believed Iraq had in terms of weapons of mass destruction. He didn't make a lot of study from it, of it, as far as we know, um, but he became convinced that, that Saddam was a threat. And I think the single best speech that anybody has given post 9-11 was his speech to the Labor Party conference in October 2001, in which he started to lay out the whole issue of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism in an extraordinary way, in the terms of globalization that I talked about earlier, as opposed to as a state-based threat. I really think he believed it. That's point one. Point two is, if anybody in the debate on Iraq was a true unilateralist, it wasn't George Bush, it wasn't Tony Blair, but it was Gerhard Schroeder. Gerhard Schroeder announced that Germany would not support a war even if the United Nations Security Council were to vote for it. It's remarkable, particularly for a German leader. I remember uh, a meeting in September 2002 at the Dutch ambassadors with the then foreign minister, now NATO Secretary General in which the concern about Germany and the way it had dealt with that issue just dominated any, this was when the US was already moving very much in that direction. Not only because of the traditional Dutch concern about Germany, but the fact here is that, that Mr. Multilateralism, the multilateralist country, had gone thoroughly unilateralist. And nobody called him on it. Blair didn't, Chirac didn't, the US didn't, and he, it's a remarkable statement. Um, so the irresponsibility, frankly, 
not just of the United States. You've heard a lot of that. The irresponsibility of Gerhard Schroeder in particular is mind-boggling when it comes to this conflict. And I actually believe I'll go further. If Bush, who I've criticized and did at the time, had called Schroeder after the election and told him, one, I want to congratulate you on your re-election, and two, I want you to know that I thought this was a really lousy way of handling the campaign. Defeat George Bush. Clinton, the three that are left. Um, that we should na use NATO now to, to, an, to take on the great experience of the greater Middle East is poppycock. What could I NATO hope, do? I hope so, yeah. Uh, yeah, question, yeah. I would like to ask a more personal question, Ivo. You talked about your American passport, but it sounded more like mechanics. I would like to know, what are you? Are you American? Are you Dutch? Are you both? And related to that, and I'm like you, married to an American and sort of feeling a little bit of both, how does that impact your effectiveness in this debate? Because people might read the harsh criticisms of the Bush administration as coming from a European, coming from somebody who is not one of us, and therefore he must be against us. So do you feel that that half and half situation impacts your position as a scholar in these subjects? Uh, short answer is no. And it's very simple. I mean, the United States is an extraordinarily tolerant and open society when it comes to immigrants. And you're one of them as long as you have a passport. Uh, and even in many ways when you don't have a passport. Uh, the Bush administration may not like me, but it's because I'm a Democrat, not because I'm Dutch. Uh, uh, how do I feel, you know, I think the one way you always know how you feel, imagine the World Cup, Holland against USA. Guess who I'm going to be supporting? Going to win. Uh, so that tells you everything. I'm the only one in the United States who I think looks at Wereldkampioenschap schaatsen, right? <laughs> and it's not because Bonnie, Bl whatever her name is, uh, Bonnie Blair or whatever is, is playing. So, you know, that's that what is. And yes, it was mechanical in the sense that I very deliberately became an American citizen in the full expectation I'd be a dual national. Uh, and, but that didn't work out because politics being what politics is. Do I regret it? No, not really. You know, I, I'm, I left here 28 years ago uh, and um, I have family here and it's wonderful to come back and I like Dorp and the, I eat more Gouda Kaas than anybody else. And, and in fact, I'm the sole customer of, of the Gouda Kaas boer in uh, wherever it is that I buy my cheese in, in Washington. But I'm, I'm, I feel American, I am American. My kids, they only know Opa and Oma, and that's about it when it comes to, uh, to Dutch. So. And I don't regret that they don't know the language. Okay, yeah, you there. I wonder in the context of what you have told us, what's your opinion on Tony Blair's decision to uh, stick with the United States and therefore come into conflict with Europe is? I think Tony Blair truly believed in what he did. I think that was a, he's a conviction politician, strange for a man who was known as, as Mr. Finger in the Wind, um, Mr. Focus Group. Um, I, I think um, for a whole variety of reasons, you know, when he became prime minister, in 1997, he was for the first time in his entire life exposed to intelligence information. It was the first time he was in government. Uh, and as a backbencher, you don't, or not, as, as a shadow uh, person, you don't get that kind of information, unlike in the United States where presidential nominees get uh, president, the presidential daily brief, the most secret um, intelligence information during the campaign. Uh, he had none of that when he became prime minister and by all accounts was completely shocked about what he believed Iraq had in terms of weapons of mass destruction. He didn't make a lot of study from it, of it, as far as we know, um, but he became convinced that, that Saddam was a threat. 
And I think the single best speech that anybody has given post 9-11 was his speech to the Labor Party conference in October 2001, in which he started to lay out the whole issue of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism in an extraordinary way, in the terms of globalization that I talked about earlier, as opposed to as a state-based threat. I really think he believed it. That's point one. Point two is, if anybody in the debate on Iraq was a true unilateralist, it wasn't George Bush, it wasn't Tony Blair, but it was Gerhard Schroeder. Gerhard Schroeder announced that Germany would not support a war even if the United Nations Security Council were to vote for it. It's remarkable, particularly for a German leader. I remember uh, a meeting in September 2002 at the Dutch ambassadors with the then foreign minister, now NATO Secretary General in which the concern about Germany and the way it had dealt with that issue just dominated any... This was when the U.S. was already moving very much in that direction, not only because of the traditional Dutch concern about Germany, but the fact here is that, that Mr. Multilateralism, the multilateralist country, had gone thoroughly unilateralist, and nobody called him on it. Blair didn't, Chirac didn't, the U.S. didn't, and he, it's a remarkable statement. Um, so the irresponsibility, frankly, not just of the United States, you've heard a lot of that, the irresponsibility of Gerhard Schroeder in particular is mind-boggling when it comes to this conflict. And I actually believe I'll go further. If Bush, who I've criticized and d did at the time, had called Schroeder after the election and told him, one, I want to congratulate you on your re-election, re and two, I want you to know that I thought this was a really lousy way of handling the campaign. But three, let's move on. We would have had a united Europe because I think the French decided to go the German route because they didn't want to have the Germans stand alone in their unilateralism. They too remember what 1914, 1870, uh, and 1939 was all about. Um, so I think there's a lot, and it's not part of the debate, and nobody wants to talk about it, but there's a lot that Mr. Schroeder in particular uh, has to account for in this debate. Um, what would then be the alternative scenario? Would, would we have uh, uh, gone with the United States in, in this Iraq situation? The problem is that this whole attacking and, and, and occupation has been completely wrong. A very, very bad decision indeed. And so, should was it? Had if, we if been it, able to stop America? Was there a kind of situation where we could reason with the administration and say, "Well, you're wrong," uh, and otherwise, the, other, the, the only other possibility is that we would have gone with the United States. No, I don't think. I, I mean, it's counterfactual history is impossible to play out. But if Germany had moved away from its position where it was in September so that by October, by the time the resolution was being debated, you in fact had an EU3 position. And you could have a British, French, uh, UK, uh, German position that basically had set out a series of benchmarks, a series of red lines that were mar far more definitive on when, in fact, you could trigger war, in fact, have one rather than two resolutions. Uh, I, I think you could have had a much better strategy of pressure. Now, would that have prevented George Bush from going to war? I don't know. Um, I do know that without Tony Blair, it would have been extraordinarily difficult for Bush to go to war, not because he didn't want to, but the American public would have turned against him. The American public didn't want it. They wanted a UN resolution. They wanted to be international. They're internationalists. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, it, I don't know what the answer is. But it was, it was possible that you would have had a much better... Re 1441, that resolution, was a really awful resolution. It, it hid the fundamental disagreement between the United States and France. And if there was a way to have an agreement, maybe it would have been different. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, we'll never know. Uh, I do think that aside from George Bush's pig-headedness and wrongness, all of which is true, uh, Gerhard Schroeder has a major role and major uh, 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 part, uh, it was a major part of the problem. Uh, okay, you, here, yeah. Uh, you, will, you will be next. That gave you a question, you will be next, okay?
intelligence. Uh, I was wondering whether the reason that they really believed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, even though it now turns out that it didn't, is that they were being fed misinformation by the Iraqi Secret Service. That in fact, Saddam Hussein, uh, feeding it through Israel and America and Britain, outsmarted the intelligence services of the West and outsmarted himself. I mean, I, I, I think this is one of the many questions that, that hangs out there. Uh, why, if he didn't have any stockpiles, which he didn't? I mean, I'm convinced of that. I don't, I don't believe that we will find them. Uh, Dick Cheney just said that we were going to look for another two years, and frankly, I think he ought to be going there and look himself for a very long time. Um, they're not there. They, never, they didn't exist. Uh, so the question is, why, quote, did he not come clean? Well, I think that actually has a pretty interesting answer, which is the belief that he had chemical weapons was central to his ability to control his population uh, and perhaps also his neighbors, but at least his cooperation. So here was the, 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 the catch-22 that Saddam faced. To come clean on the weapons of mass destruction, to avoid war, meant that he would have been overthrown. No, that, that was, no. The real question in my mind is not, actually not whether he was feeding misinformation. The real question is why didn't smart people, and boy these people in the intelligence services are smart, ever think about these possibilities? Why was it that confronted with a failure to find evidence, positive evidence of weapons, the answer was, boy, he's great at deception, as opposed to, let's assume there are no weapons. What could explain his behavior? Which is what we're all doing right now. And my, you know, you, you read the 55 articles that are out there, including by my colleague Ken Pollack uh, at the Brookings Institution about why this might be the case. I wish he'd done that before the war, by the way, when he was still advocating going to war. Uh, but now, you know, he has all his theories, and lots of them, we all have our theories on the basis of the fact that we're asking a different question. Not as, is he good at deception, but is, what is an explanation for his behavior if he has no weapons? Uh, and, you know, the explanation of internal control is perfectly consistent and leads you to a whole series of, uh, 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 of going back through the evidence that leads you to conclusions that we're now generally reaching. Uh, including, I think, the most important conclusion, which is that Kamal Hussein, the uh, son-in-law of uh, Saddam who left and uh, who, who uh, defected in 1995 and had the silly idea of going back, believing his father-in-law would forgive him. He did. His neck was severed of his body. But um, you know, everything that Kamal Hussein said was correct. Everything he told us was correct. And there were two things we didn't believe, which was that he said they didn't have chemical and they didn't have biological weapons. And when you think about, you know, you go back through the evidence if you had different, it's that analytical capacity, it's the blindness of the analytical community on these issues that, are, that is truly astonishing when you're spending 30 plus billion dollars a year. Then there's a different issue of whether Blair and Bush and Cheney at all uh, exaggerated even the information they were fed. I mean, I think all of that happened. They exaggerated the, the, the information. The information itself was wrong. Um, uh, and, the, and the question is why was it wrong? In part because it was analytically wrong and in part because they wanted to please their political masters. Um, so there's enough scandal here to feed a lot of PhD dissertations. Yeah, uh, yeah. your question now. Um, I'm still a little bit curious about the actual revolutionary nature of Bush's foreign policy. Um, most of my IR studies have been during the Clinton administration, and um, your premise for the revolutionary part was that Bush regards international organizations and treaties as a constraint for the good actions the U.S. wants to do. But under the Clinton administration, there were numerous treaties which the U.S. was still one of the only Western nations not to sign. Um, this was a Republican initiative, but the U.S. didn't pay the U.N. bill for several years. And when there were terrorist attacks on the embassies in Africa, Clinton didn't ask for an international coalition when he went 
and um, had his strategical strikes in Iraq. How then is Bush's policy is truly revolutionary? Good question. When you only have 40 minutes to explain it, it gets, which is why we have questions. How is it revolutionary? It's an attitude. Uh, compare, compare Harry Truman. Harry Truman, at the end of 1945, confronted a world in which American power was relatively far greater than even American power is today. And what did Harry Truman decide? Did he decide to impose an American imperium? No. He decided to create international security institutions, financial and economic institutions, to spend $80 billion in today's dollars on rehabilitating former foes in a fundamental belief that American power depending on international cooperation and that the best way you could get that cooperation was to create institutions that served America's purpose and those of the ones you wanted to have cooperate with you. And that became the tenet of American foreign policy for 60 years, including during the Clinton administration. It's true that Bill Clinton had this wonderful knack of biting his lower left lip and talk the multilateral talk and then walk the unilateral walk and he'd say, I'd really love to sign this treaty, but the Republicans in Congress won't allow me to. But there is a difference between that attitude and the one we have today. Bill Clinton signed the ICC on the last day it was possible on the 31st of December 2000 in the belief that being part of the regime might in the end help us a way to reform it so that we could be part of it. George Bush has done everything he could to try to undermine the regime. Bill Clinton wanted to modify and amend the ABM Treaty, negotiated and did, uh, uh, continued to negotiate. George Bush walked away. Bill Clinton uh, wanted to have the Kyoto Accords, in fact signed them, uh, uh, and would have been able, I think, to move forward on ratification if, to be blue to the flank, the Europeans in November of 2000 had done what they finally did in May 2001, which is to endorse admission trading. Um, and, 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 but the Bush administration didn't want to have a deal on Kyoto, they just wanted to walk away from it. And here's the difference. Bill Clinton understood, as I, I think even Ronald Reagan understood, that in order to serve American interests, you had to work with others, and that institutions were a means to that end. It's not that they were convict, convinced multilateralists. It doesn't change the Kagan thesis, by the way, about, uh, uh, about European and American differences. It was, it was highly instrumental in terms of multilateralism, but there was a belief that you needed those institutions to get things done. The Bush, the revolutionary nature, is that Bush believes that these institutions are obstacles to getting anything done, that they are constraints on the ability of America to get things done, that treaties are not just bad because they don't fulfill the purposes that they set out to do, they're bad because they constrain the United States. Uh, they don't believe in arms control treaties because bad guys cheat and good guys get constrained. It's a direct quote, by the way, from John Bolton. Uh, that is not how American presidents have approached this fundamental issue. So it's revolutionary in that sense. It's not, revol it's not that George Bush only goes it alone at all times. Uh, he'll build coalitions, he'll use NATO as he does in Afghanistan when it serves his purpose. But only if it serves his purpose and he's willing to throw him out the moment it doesn't. One last question from the audience. Well, if you pay me enough, I'll give you uh, okay. Um, I was wondering on uh, how you feel uh, lobby groups and, and businesses influence Bush's policies in addition to just his world view. Uh, thinking of groups like the Carlyle Group and that type of organization. I, I'm not a big believer in, in the notion that the economic interests are guiding American foreign policy. I'm not a big believer that oil was the crucial reason for why we went into Iraq. I, I do believe without oil, the Middle East wouldn't be very important to the United States. Uh, same would be true for Western Europe, by the way, or Japan or other places. Um, but it is clear that George Bush believes uh, that these corporations serve 
America's interests in a fundamental way. And that helping them along is beneficial to them and as well as to the United States. Um, it doesn't mean that they guide American policy. Uh, but there is a coincidence of American policy on energy, uh, on a whole host of other issues that is there and is genuine. Um, it, it's not causal, it's a correlation, uh, if you want to put it in those terms. Um, so it, it would be wrong to say that American corporate interests are guiding American policy, but it would be right to say that American policy has favored corporate interests. Um, you get people to sponsor you uh, who believe, you know, the reason Halliburton et al. S supports George Bush is because George Bush believes in what they stand for. It's a, again, it's not a, it's not, it's not a notion that George Bush would not do the things he wouldn't do but for the money that is part of his campaign. He'd do it anyway um, because that's how he believes the world is run. Um, it's not surprising. It's not surprising that trade unions support Democrats. It's because Democrats believe in labor. Does that mean that trade unions control the Democratic political agenda? You know, I mean, they have an influence, but they don't control it. Uh, they control it to the extent that Democrats have the belief in, in labor. So it's, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's not a controlling one. Uh, and, that, and there is an important difference uh, in, uh, in, in looking at it in those terms. Okay, thank you. And now some closing remarks. I found my watch, so. Thank you, um, Ivor, for unveiling some of the hidden and I think deeper motives of um, American policy as, as they are now. Um, thank you. I am. Um, I hope you enjoyed it all, and I think the debate we stimulated was also thanks to you, but also thanks to Martin. Thanks for your nice introduction into Dutch. I think that was a good uh, change for, for once. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for, um, for moderating it all. Um, Ivo Daldo will sign uh, both uh, versions of the book uh, in Dutch and in English, but I do recommend the Dutch version, though, uh, here in this table. Um, the bar will be open. You can have drinks. We can uh, talk a little bit longer uh, if you have time. Um, there are questionnaires somewhere about the John Adams Institute and what we do, and we'd like to have your opinion. If you have time, please fill them out and return them at our information desk. You can also get some more information about our institute there. And I want to tell you that our next event is on April 28th in the same venue, and we'll have uh, a talk given by journalist and writer Adrienne Nicole Leblanc. Doesn't sound Dutch, uh, American either, but she's not Dutch. She's really, truly American. And she wrote on social issues in New York, and I think her book is really remarkable. The book is called A Random Family. She will discuss it here with Ruth Oldenziel, who is here tonight too. Thank you all for coming, and please have a safe journey home, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.